I can hear you looking sharp. Cool. Let me share my slides. Can you see those? Okay. Yes. Looks great. Perfect. Awesome. Guys, we're going to spend especially the next two sessions in some uh, where this conversion rate optimization and then some website teardowns, which is going to be conversion rate optimization part two. By the way, if you'd like to um, be in that website teardown that's going to take place in 30 minutes, you can submit your website. Just send your website to me right here in chat and we'll get ready to tear you down. Uh, all right. With that being said, Nick, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Nick DeSabato. I'm a designer and writer from the city of Chicago. Thanks to Derek and e-commerce tech for having me here today. Thanks to all of you so much for coming. Uh, we're going to talk about optimization today. And I think the vast majority of people seem to think about optimization as running A-B tests, but that's not really the whole story. I view optimization as creating a reliably profitable process for de-risking new design decisions because you're going to be changing things on your store. You're going to find some way to improve it. And you want to make sure that you're helping it more than you're hurting it, right? And that you're making the right decisions and being as smart about that as humanly possible. The goal, as in any part of your business, is to make more money off of optimization than you put into it. And when that happens, your opti maturity around optimization ends up increasing. And as you gain more maturity with optimization, you become a better optimizer. It becomes a virtuous cycle. Um, in this talk, I'm going to be discussing how to create a holistic process for optimizing your store such that you consistently get a high, high ROI out of the activity of doing it. Because I think a lot of people, they'll like install Google Optimize and they'll run an A-B test and they'll be like, it didn't work. And then they don't know who to talk to about it. Or they do some best practices on conversion Excel and they're like, well, that was fine, but we didn't see the needle move. Well, why not? Um, I'm going to talk about why not, and I'm going to talk about what you can do about it. Um, so first, you know, the first thing that you can do really before you even run an A-B test is make sure that your store has a decent baseline for A-B testing. Um, that involves doing a lot of incredibly unsexy work of thinking what segments are not converting effectively and what can we do to try and improve the store with some best practices. That can be some, you know, heuristic evaluations. That can be some basic things like compressing images. That can be taking a look at all of your apps. So if you aren't compressing your images, Shopify kind of does this by default now. Crush.pix is an app that does this for you. Uh, a lot of the time you can lo look at uh, performance on your store and see that page speed isn't performing up to snuff. The best page speed metric that I use is the one that's inside of Google Analytics. That's not the one that Google has that's called uh, page speed insights. It's literally the site speed tab in Google Analytics is the one that tells you how long it takes for people to actually be downloading a page on your store. If it's loading any less than roughly two seconds for mobile, you probably have a conversion opportunity. Faster pages convert faster. Um, and the fewer apps that you have installed, the faster your store will load. And site speed maps naturally to conversion rate as mentioned. So you probably want to make sure that you're only running apps that you're actually using. Um, Anything that's not actually showing up in Google Analytics site speed is probably a vanity metric. You use GA to identify precisely how well your store is performing across browsers and pages. So if you go into site speed and you pull down on the right hand side of this column here, average page load time per second, and you switch the graph in the top right to show relative to the overall mean, you can see what browsers are performing well, what stand to be improved. And you can see here that maybe Firefox actually needs some improvement. For some reason, there's probably some bug happening and you need to actually find something to fix on it. Um, for example, I know this sounds incredibly unsexy, but this is the thing you need to do that you probably just haven't done with your store yet. Um, I worked a couple of years ago with a skincare makeup store called Boom by Cindy Joseph to improve their conversion rate. I went in to Google Analytics the first day I started working there and their average page load time was 16.8 seconds. Time out 16.8 seconds and tell me if you think that's an acceptable duration of time to be loading a page. Um, we went through the same process that I just listed, which seems boring. You might already be doing it. We got it below 10, which felt like a win, but is still not great. And we launched all the changes and the conversion rate went up by 9.1% overnight. I think I made them like $300,000 in two weeks. Uh, nobody thinks to do this stuff because they're running around fixing a million other fires. And there are fires right now. I get it. Um, but if you take the time, you might see a big win on conversion rate or average revenue per user. Why is making money right up front important? It's because you have more signal to be working with. You can call tests faster if you have more people converting on your store. 
the way that you determine the minimum sample size for a given experiment, the main parameter is your existing conversion rate. So basically the rich get richer. And so you wanna be doing this ahead of time, not just because it's common sense, not just because it's a high RI activity, but because it makes your optimization actually function more effectively. Um, and so that's the very beginning thing. You might already be doing this. Here's the thing that you're almost certainly not doing. Um, you need to start optimizing exactly what you have. And I'm not gonna teach you how to configure an A-B test in Google Optimize because that's the easy part and there are a million how-tos for it. What I am going to talk about is the harder bit, which is how to come up with reliably winning test ideas such that you can move the needle for your existing store. Because the people just are like, oh, I'll test the headline, oh, I'll test the call to action, oh, I'll test an upsell. And those are all important to be testing, but what do you change them to? Why? Why are you changing them? What do you know what to do? And the way you figure that out is through research. No store really knows their customers until they start observing and asking them. And research is how you come up with test ideas that work. It's how I come up with test ideas that work. It's how all of my clients come up with test ideas that work. Research comes in two forms, qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative research involves gaining insights that more involve the feelings and stories that customers have. You wanna empathize more with their context, develop something that makes them feel heard and understood. That can involve talking to customers, finding interesting feedback or support inquiries, sitting in a customer's environment and watching them actually work. Quantitative research involves measuring something. That can involve gathering analytics, tracking sales data, running heat maps, figuring out what traffic sources that people come from, even surveying them and having them grade your service or product on a scale. So basically, qualitative research is what they do, and quantitative research is what they actually, or I got that backwards. Qualitative research is what they say they're, they're going to do. It's what actually motivates them. Quantitative research is what they actually do. And these can be very different. You know, it's people will tell you something and they're not like trying to lie to you. It's just they aren't thinking about buying from you right in the moment and they're not able to voice their own monologue about what it is they're doing. You can try and tease that out through something like a usability test or a guided interview or something like that. But most of the time you need to understand both what they're saying and what they're doing. And so you kind of need both of these in relatively equivalent proportions. It's really important to have about a 50-50 blend of both of these activities in any optimization program. For quantitative research, you have things like heat and, oh, you have things like heat and scroll maps. Um, if you have an online store, you should be running heat and scroll maps. They show you where people are clicking and how far they're going down a page. Hotjar is the one that I recommend. It's super, super cheap. I have a link that I can paste after the talk. Um, they're great for figuring out how people work with a given page what elements they pay attention to, what elements they ignore, what causes them to bounce, whether they're actively reading. Analytics, you have Google Analytics installed, you might not be leveraging it that well. They tell you about the effect of different traffic sources, third-party promotions, advertising, demographics, your overall goals, and it's effectively enterprise-grade software. They gave you so much to be working with. You can have somebody as a full-time job working on Google Analytics for your store and still only get a little bit of insight out of it, and you still don't know if you're getting the right kind of data out of it. Um, I would recommend if you are very new to Google Analytics, taking a look at Conversion XL's two how-to guides. They have one about how to actually configure Google Analytics, and then another that's kind of a more deep dive course on how to take a look at specific goals and look at relative conversion rates to the site mean. The real key with Google Analytics is not just understanding whether the conversion rate overall is changing over the time, but really diving in on understanding specific customer segments. How is mobile doing? How is desktop doing? Is it better or worse than the overall store mean? Um, how is direct versus organic versus paid traffic doing? Um, how do those convert relative to the site mean? How does email convert relative to the site mean? You wanna take a look at those deeper segments so that you can gain a greater insight of what the overall customer journey looks like and how relatively wallet out they might happen to be. That also gives you a sense of what I'll just call opportunities are in conversion rate where the conversion rate is way lower and you wanna get it up, right? Um, especially in the case of mobile, I, you know, one of the first things that I do with most of my clients is I show them that mobile is one third of desktop and 85% of their traffic and they're running a huge Instagram campaign and it's almost all smartphone traffic and nobody's buying. Why? It's because we didn't design mobile first, right? And that's a five minute check on Google Analytics, but a hard truth that I don't think people are really open to understanding necessarily. 
and qualitative research, you have um, a lot of things that people really don't do and really, really should be doing more of. Uh, one of them is interviews. Um, that involves recruiting qualified participants, usually your past customers, interviewing them about how they use your store and compensating them for their time. Um, I get them on the phone for an hour. I give them a gift card to my store, to Amazon or something, whatever they ask for. There are so many great resources out there about conducting interviews, and it shouldn't just be the purview of user experience designers like myself. Um, Steve Portugal's Interviewing Users and Nate Bolton totally to Tony Tula Timute's Remote Research are both amazing books. They're both out by Rosenfeld Media. Uh, I strongly recommend taking a look. The former book costs $22 and does more to teach you about interviewing in two hours than anything that I can do in this talk. Super, super valuable. And if you haven't done this and interviewed like five to seven customers and really asked them like why they came to you and why they bought what they did and what made them feel the most comfortable about their purchase, like you will make that money back very, very quickly because you'll be able to start updating your store to reduce objections, reduce the perception of risk, get people excited about like really shining with your product, right? Next up is usability tests. Um, this one costs a little bit of money. It is so worth it though. If you go to trymyui.com or conversioncrimes.com, buy five tests, they do all the recruitment for you and they do all of the actual execution of the tests. All you get back is the results within a couple of days. Have somebody purchase a product with like a fake credit card and fake customer information and have them do it on a variety of browsers and devices. Third-party usability testing is the absolute best thing that you can do to surface conversion killing usability issues. Um, as of press time, I believe five tests on Try My UI go for $350. If you don't make that back in a day, I would be very surprised if you have never gotten out of your head and tried to do this. Um, Post-purchase surveys. There are a bunch of apps that do this for you. I sometimes just code like a little embed from SurveyMonkey on the thank you page if they're on Shopify Plus. A super, super useful for surfacing ongoing issues with the store you ask. What held you back from purchasing today? Um, and then if they enter a customer service stuff you have on the thank you page, like, hey, you need to email orders app da, 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 to get your customer service inquiry handled, whatever. Um, you send any support inquiries there, you mine the rest for customer service um, insights and understand exactly how to fix bugs. I fix so many bugs out of post-purchase surveys, y'all. It is amazing. I use it, sometimes I just copy and paste a post-purchase survey response and make it the H1 of the entire store and then the conversion rate goes up by 5%. You're just listening and channeling back to your customers because they're probably not alone in their struggles. And sometimes you just get something that's like very universally resonant and like why you showed up to do this. So those are just a few research activities. Once you have research together, you get data, you get the results of a, um, of a set of interviews or of heat maps, or you took a look at Google Analytics, you found something, right? You need to translate it into concrete decisions. Sometimes it's as easy as copying and pasting a post-purchase survey and making it your H1, but most of the time you have to start guessing. And in designer parlance, going back to like the 80s, that process is called synthesis. And it's kind of a way of just making sense of how the world is working. You have some information, what do you do with it? It's a three-step process. So first, you kind of identify the problem. Perhaps it's easy to assess from a heat map or analytics. Like people are ignoring an element, people are beelining for an element, people are having trouble loading a given page on a certain browser. Um, perhaps it takes a little more effort to analyze what's going on. Either way, you identify a specific problem. Then you speculate on a reason as to why that problem might be happening. You don't know what that is, but you have to find a reason, right? Sometimes it's clear, like you found a bug. Okay, great, fix the bug, congratulations. Sometimes it's a little bit more squishy, like they didn't feel comfortable moving ahead for some reason. Okay, well, maybe you need more research at this point to interview people and understand what's holding them back, right? Either way, if you're not confident about the reason, go back to step one, figure it out, research further, more data, different methods, whatever it happens to be. And then step three, you improve the design. Um, so. You can try and strike at the motivation for the problem, try and give a good reason. This is a case of super old client of mine. Uh, they were concerned that it was literally just the bootstrap theme and you were trusting your entire DNS with them. Fairly reasonable. All right, so we made it look modern and got like a simple comp together and did it, right? Um, maybe you need to understand like specific fixes that you're doing. Either way, you're coming up with a specific improvement that addresses what the reason for the problem happens to be. So this three parts process, it 
sounds like something you do all the time and you do because it's how you follow an intuition. You have a problem, you have a reason, you have a solution, right? But actually being concrete about it and writing down specific answers to each one of these things, that I think is the core of the design process. You outline an issue, you discuss your thinking, you create a solution and it's a guess, right? Because you don't really know until it's actually run in front of paying customers. So only then can you really start testing. Let's talk a little bit about what that involves because you have a design decision and then you're going to end up turning it into a test that eventually you're going to be running past people. Once you have a design decision, you need to create a hypothesis. In testing parlance, a hypothesis contains three components. First is the change. You already came up with that. Great. Second is the goal. Um, in most stores cases, this is fairly clear. With e-commerce, it's like average revenue per user, average order value, conversion rate, uh, customer lifetime value if you hate yourself and you want to measure impact for months on end, and so on and so forth. Um, those are fairly easy. With e-commerce, it's you're taking the money at a specific place. The metrics are not really appreciably changing over time to the best of my knowledge, but you need a goal, right? And then you need the expected impact. So an increase by 5%, say. So put together, it would say, I don't know, changing the add to cart button from green to red will increase average revenue per user by 5%. That's a lousy hypothesis, but go with me on it. It's at least a feature complete one. Um, you can't run a test without the specific magnitude of the change in mind, because that's another variable that goes into determining the minimum sample size for your test. With conversion rate and expected impact, those are the things that go into how you actually calculate what the sample size ends up looking like. Uh, the way that I do this is with, uh, it's a super old timey AB testing guy named Evan Miller. Um, he has, a, uh, he has a, a calculator utility basically that shows how many visitors need to go to each individual variation. And so tests don't necessarily run by time. They run by the number of visitors to each variation, including your control. So you have a control, a variant, that's your A, your B, and you figure out how many people need to come to each. And he wrote about this much better than I possibly could. Uh, if you go to that first link, how not to run an A-B test, it goes down all of the math in a way that makes, I was a math major and it still makes my eyes bleed. But the calculator over here, he just put that together and you write up here what the conversion rate is, uh, exists of your store right now, and then what the minimum detectable effect is that you want to be actually calculating. And you want the uh, overall statistical significance to be around 95%, so you can be reasonably certain that you're actually doing this right. Um, so you do all of this. I use this calculator every single day in my job. You should too, right? Now, that sounds great. I could just stop the talk here, um, but there's another huge part of this that you need to be paying attention to, and that's prioritization. That's where I take off my, you know, designer hat and I put on my consultant hat because we can't change everything at once. And even if we could, that would be super risky because we wouldn't be able to keep what works and throw away what doesn't. So next, we figure out what experiments are going to run in what order. Uh, and not all ideas are equal, and it's very easy for teams to be attracted to a shiny new idea. So we want to make sure that we have a clear sense of how every change fits into the big picture. Whenever a new idea comes in, no matter who ventures it, I let anybody, the janitor up to the CEO, can, do, can tell me anything that they want. But we're going to take any idea that they have, and we're going to vet it for, uh, on a score from 1 to 10, add them up like it's a Zagat rating, and then sort in descending order. The first is feasibility. So in short, how hard is it to be build out? Does it require development effort, new prototypes, wireframes? Can I do it in Google Optimize in five minutes? Uh, score 10 if it's super easy, score 1 if it's not. And I go through in greater detail on my blog. If you go to draft.nu slash blog, I go through a huge thing about how to prioritize according to each one of these metrics because there's obviously a great more detail to all of this. But yeah. Um, and then next, you have impact. So this is an area that has a lot of guesswork. How likely is this change to make an impact on the business's primary metric? For example, if I'm making a, an A-B test on my footer, probably it's not going to make a huge impact. But if I do it on my homepage's masthead, a ton of people are going to be seeing it. It's a huge load-bearing element. It's the first impression of the store. It's going to have a massive impact, right? And then finally, you have strategic alignment with the business. On a scale from 1 to 10, how much does this align with your business's long-term goals? And that is not an answer to how much someone in sales wants the test to happen. It's not, you don't get a 10 because the CEO said so. You just 
look at the strategy, you have a North Star, you know what's the right thing to be doing for all of this. And it's not really a short-term play. Sometimes radically huge things like a global pandemic happen, but the vast majority of time, it's going to stay pretty consistent over time. And then you add those up and then you have basically a list of experiments and you just do them in descending order. We start running experiments. Sometimes I work with in-house development teams to put everything into practice. Frequently I code and deploy everything myself because I know enough about programming to be very dangerous. And at this stage, I'm kind of half project manager, half on the ground fixer. So, you know, being a good optimizer, you just have to learn a lot of different techniques. And when an experiment ends, you measure its impact against the primary metric. Usually it's average revenue per user or conversion rate for us. Try to assess any knock-on effects. I love running heat maps for variance to determine if customer behavior changes in ways that we might want to be assessing. And then we make a formal recommendation as to whether we should roll out the change to everybody, a small segment of the, the, uh, those customers, or nobody at all, right? That's what it's supposed to do. A test should answer the question, do we roll this change out to everybody? That's it. It's not meant to do anything else. And so when you look, make sense of the results, you know that testing is fundamentally rooted in science and statistics. You're dealing with the number of people visiting a site, you're dealing with the number of conversions that are happening, and you're trying to prove its success. So it's effectively an application of the scientific method to your design process. And if you hated science in school, I did at times too, in spite of the math major thing, that's fine. Um, Evan Miller is back to rescue you. You plug the numbers in here, you do an incredibly unsexy thing, which is called a chi-square test, and you determine how much there was a change in the data that you're actually putting together. So you just say, here's the number of conversions, here's the number of visitors, here's the number of conversions, here's the number of visitors for each variation, and make sure that it's actually, you can be confident that you're probably going to move the needle. Uh, I only call variations if they calculate a 95% or up confidence interval. Um, lots of people use 99, some people even use 100 because they're crazy, that's totally fine. So I just whipped through in about 25, 28 minutes of a brief summary of how to run A-B testing. And almost none of it actually talked about at, like building the literal A-B test. It's all the process around the A-B test. You need to create a rigorous process around it. And the best way that I found to do this is researching. And you think like, oh, Nick D, you could throw that away. You don't have to research. And that's true, right? You could stab in the dark or settle internal debates. And I don't know, like you might get lucky. But then your test rate is probably going to hover around the industry average, which means about one in eight of all of your tests are going to significantly move the needle. And that's about accurate to all of e-commerce. Uh, my own success rate with tests that don't contain research is 18%. So I'm not even doing that great, right? Like, and I've run over 500 tests for over 40 clients. And I don't want to beat it by only that much, right? I want to beat it by that much. This is what happens when you research. Um, we have about a two-thirds success rate. We've generated several million dollars in overall lifetime revenue for our clients. And you get to keep those wins, right? Like you could work with me and eventually, you know, get all of this. We part ways. You're still going to have an improved store after we're all done, right? Research informs test ideas. And as you keep testing, the goalposts change. You use tests to generate new ideas. So you're never really finished researching. Um, both research and testing should be proceeding into perpetuity. I usually research as tests are going on. Um, and if you want your business to get a solid ROI from optimization, I think you need to start from research first. It's the only way I found to get tests that reliably win. And they win pretty well. So um, with that in mind, if you ever want to work with us, um, you can go to draft.nu slash revise, which is our big flagship offering. If you, go, if you want to just take a 160-page dramatic reading of my job description and do it yourself, you can go to draft.nu slash value. It's my latest book called Value-Based Design. It's a physical book. Uh, it's a good way to, I don't know, curl up before you go to sleep or something like that. Um, and with that in mind, um, I write letters about optimization and business every Tuesday. You can get them at this link. Um, and I'll be around to just answer questions and provide clarification, other facts and stuff in the chat after this. Uh, but yeah, that's it. Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you so much, Nick. You kept me so busy taking notes for you. <laughs> um, I love it though, because the speed, it was perfect. Like information, information, information. And we took really great show notes on this. So if you guys aren't in the show notes doc, you can 
Uh, here, I'll share the link with you right now one more time in case you just joined us. Just bookmark that document and we'll continue to add show notes to it as we go. Um, definitely, if you're, yeah, I, I get asked this question from every single merchant that I talk to. It's, okay, how can I increase conversion rate on my site? And then they do things like, well, what do you think about adding this design or changing this? And I'm like, that's like not even how you start with conversion rate optimization. Yes, maybe a little more social proof would be great, but do you, are you just gonna install a widget and hope for the best? Or are you gonna test it? And like, and like should you test that over other things and how to prioritize and yeah. how to do actual research and understand what your customers are struggling with? That's where it's supposed to begin. So I think, I hope from now on, everyone that watched this, Nick, will, will agree with that as the premise of the starting point of conversion rate optimization. Uh, I, I doubt it'll work, but maybe we made some progress. <laughs> I hope I changed some minds today. I loved like last week, somebody came in, they were a prospective client. They're like, well, what should I change on my store? I'm like, I don't know. They're like, what? I'm like, I don't know. They're like, what do you mean? I'm, I'm, you're the expert. You've been doing this for years. I'm like, because I haven't figured out how your store operates and I, it's different for everyone. Yeah. What works for any one store worked for that store, not for you. That's it. I agree completely. 